getting classy with it with a focus on language modeling. Now, when I say get classy, of course I mean the classroom assessment scoring system. What does the class measure? Well, class provides guidelines for what teachers should be able to do. The class is organized with three broad domains, emotional support, classroom organization, and instructional support. Language modeling is a dimension within the instructional support domain. Well, let's look at language modeling in detail. Language modeling captures the quality and amount of teachers' use of language stimulation and language facilitation techniques. What indicators might you see? Frequent conversations, open-ended questions, repetition and extension, self and parallel talk, and advanced language. Uh, wait a minute. Uh, Angela, can you rewind? <laughs> Repeat that, please. Okay, so let's actually rewind and talk about each of the indicators in detail. This is one of my favorite dimensions in class because I find that teachers already do this. Now, there's no better way to describe this dimension than referencing some of our most popular talk shows. So let's start with <laughs> none other than the talk. <laughs> when we think about frequent conversations and thinking about this indicator, here are some key points. First of all, we want to have back and forth exchanges with students. We want to have conversations. Teachers should be initiating conversations with students, actively listening, giving relevant responses, and also relevant questions. So, oh, I'll never forget one of my first class observations when I was sitting there observing, and a teacher said, and now we about to play the quiet game. Oh, you couldn't imagine my disappointment as I sat there with teachers not saying anything and children not saying anything. Well, needless to say, that teacher scored very low, low in this dimension. So we want to stay away from shh or the quiet game, <laughs> for example, and also keeping in mind um, that we're also focusing on peer conversations as well. So when working with the teachers that I work with and provide consultation, we really found that there were a couple of times a day that teachers really struggled in this dimension and especially with this indicator. And there were certain activities such as circle time, for example. Uh, sometimes children just wanted to talk and talk and talk, and teachers wanted to facilitate that but didn't know how to control or manage all of that talking. So a couple of things to think about. The person talking is the person learning. So child talk should be frequent. Um, teachers are actually facilitating that talk with questions and right and back and forth exchanges. Uh, try to be reflective instead of directive. So here's an example at circle time. Um, a child is sitting and, I can't see, I can't see. Instead of being directive and saying, move over here, or Bobby, come here, try being saying a reflective question, such as, huh, what could we do, or how could you sit so everyone could see? How could we solve this problem? What this would do is actually it would touch on other, you know, dimensions and domains within the class. And also it would facilitate more conversation. So some of my teachers were like, well, Angela, some children have no problem. And actually I'm having a hard time controlling that, especially within a situation such as circle. So for an example, what do you think about this story? Raising hand. <gasps> Go ahead. Well, my mommy and my mommy, um, so on Tuesday, uh, 
and, and, and we went to the store. And so the teacher, first of all, was a little confused. Thank you for sharing, Jovan. Um, I am wondering, how does that fit with brown bear, brown bear? <laughs> so go ahead and ask that question. Even when it seems like a child's response is not relevant, ask them, because it could be. It could be something in the story about brown bear reminded the child about being at the store with their mother. Also, give pause. Let a child get their words out. We are actually trying to facilitate language um, and support language in conversation. So another key thing would be stand there and don't do anything. Pause. And try not to finish children's sentences for them, to hurry them along. Because the goal of this, right, um, dimension and looking at this indicator is to facilitate language stimulation and you know facilitation with young children. Okay. Another tip that we use again at a difficult time such as circle was the teacher would say uh, for example what do you think about the story? Hey turn to a partner and tell them I'm going to set the timer for a minute, and then we'll, a couple of us will share. So that also was a great way to ask questions, get all the children talking for a minute or two, and then bing! All right, if you hear my voice, clap three times. One, two, three, eyes on me. All right, well, we're just going to share out one or two of our friends. So that was actually really helpful to get that language, but also make it manageable as well. All right, let's look at another indicator. Oh, yes, Wendy Williams, how you doing? So another indicator would be open-ended questions will be another strategy to facilitate language stimulation. So what are open-ended questions? Open-ended questions are questions that require more than a one-word response. So you would, tr even though we ask simple questions such as what color is this, that is actually a closed question because there's only one answer. So a more open question um, that would elicit the same kind of answer potentially would be what do you see? Then a child could mention many attributes such as color, shape, texture, you know, and so we want to get as much language facilitation as possible. Other great open-ended questions, how are these two things alike? What would happen if, what do you like best in the story or about your day? Uh, how did you know that or how did you figure that out? Tell me about your picture. What's happening here? Tell me about the problem. What does this remind you of? If you were the mater or you were the bear, what would you do? Why did you pick that book? Why did you put that there? What can we do to keep paint from dripping on the floor? See, don't forget that sometimes we focus our question on um, academic activities such as circle time or small group or even free play. But don't forget those social emotional times throughout the day. How could we solve this problem? How could we fix this? What would happen if you took all the blocks? How would everyone feel? What, would that, what could we do? Uh, what would happen if you keep adding blocks? What would happen if you take all the toys? <laughs> How could you sit so everyone can see? How would you feel if that happened to you? And of course, if children don't want to talk, well, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> so open-ended questions actually stimulate children to talk and respond and to us and also to one another. Okay? Keep a couple of key things to keep in mind. Now, this was just an example, so don't fire one question after the other. It should be conversational, natural, and authentic. 
Oh, what did you notice? The child is talking. Well, I saw three birds, and the birds were flying. Okay. Oh, I saw that too. Yeah, the part, yeah, I did see them. They were over there in the corner. Um, what do you think might happen if one bird, you know, flew this way and another bird flew that way? You know, so you want to make sure that in between questions, you're repeating, you're, um, you know, making your own observations, you're describing yourself, and then you may ask another question to keep that conversation going. All right, so in the challenge, hey, Angela, do you have a kids that I have? Because when I ask them questions, they don't answer. Sometimes they stare at me. Oh, and sometimes they leave the area once I started asking questions. I even had one child to start crying after I asked a question. Sound familiar? So a couple of things. Remember that this dimension looks at the quality and amount of teacher use of language um, and facilitation techniques. So what you're looking at is how you stimulate and support children. It's not really, per se, assessing how the child answers. Some children can answer with a stare, um, an eye gaze. That means that they're responding. <laughs> so you're going to respond back. You don't always have to answer a question with a verbal response. They could be answering it by going, hmm, or a frown, or a eye gaze. Looking up means that they're responding to you. Or sometimes reading their cues. Because sometimes when a child is um, trying to respond, they're trying to gather the words together. So again, back to pausing. Um, enough, another way to kind of make sure you're giving enough time for a child to respond is you're thinking, aren't you? Man, this is a tough one, right? Okay. Uh, sometimes children will not give a verbal response. They will point. They will move. They will look up. They will look over at that area. So that is conversation. Okay. So keep that in mind. Just because children may not respond verbally doesn't mean we stop asking questions. You don't stop talking to babies because they can't talk. When you ask questions, they learn what a question is. And it actually supports them in being able to answer in the future. Also, don't forget that some cultures or some households, right, in their home is not supporting them. Many cultures still are under the, you know, kind of thought that children are to be seen and not heard. So sometimes when they're asking questions at home, they're told to be quiet. It'll take some time to understand that you have a different way of interacting with them. Okay? I know personally, my parents always ask rhetorical questions. Huh, I wonder what happened. I would answer. They said, be quiet. <laughs> this, this, you weren't supposed to answer the question. So keep in mind that some things that you do at school may conflict with what's happening at home. That's okay. That sometimes parents are, you know, overwhelmed or busy or exhausted. So what we're trying to do is build skills they may not be getting at home. Sometimes we're under the realization you might be answering your own question. So a child may say nothing or pause or look a particular way, and then you could read, you know, kind of answer it with that gesture or that look or kind of move forward in the conversation. So for example, well what are you what what are you thinking about? And the child kind of pauses, you know, doesn't really respond, maybe kind of looks at a car, for example. Oh, I see. You're busy playing with your cars. And then now zoom, zoom, crash, you know, play with a child, and then kind of go in with a question that's focused in on what they're playing with. Maybe your question, see, questions have to be individualized. Make sure they're not too long. Make sure it's not question after question, back to back. Okay, that's one way to stop a conversation. Uh, <laughs> make sure that your question is relevant and fits to what's going on in, right in the circumstance and fits to what the child enjoys. Sometimes you can facilitate discussion if you think about the child's interest. All right. 
So, oh, of course, I cannot talk about talk shows without talking about Oprah, the queen of the talk show. So another indicator that we're looking at in terms of language modeling is repetition and extension. And if you notice, Oprah does that as a technique in her talk show. She even will repeat what someone says and then expand on that. Oh, so, so I heard you saying, you know, um, Tom Cruise, <laughs> that, you're, that you are, you have a new girlfriend. Tell me more about that. Tell me about how you guys met. So she's taking what they're saying, right, repeating it, and then extending or elaborating or, or adding something to it, whether it be a question or a, for our kids in particular, a more complex statement to teach them about talking. So here's an example that fits for our classroom preschool. So in a, if you work with children I work with, sometimes some children have very limited language. Some children don't. So here's an example where a child just says, car. And then you look at the child to see exactly what it is they're talking about, because they just said one phrase. And then you're going to repeat, car. Yes, you are right. That is a car outside our window. So you see how we're repeating, affirming what the child is saying, like, hey, I'm listening to you. And then making the phrase into a complete sentence. Zoom. Huh, yes, that car did pull away swiftly. Swiftly is just another word for fast. Zoom. So add a novel or interesting word. Now don't forget to connect that word to something the child said. So zoom, the child seemed to be talking about speed and also repeating back the word at the end of the, of the um, exchange. Migo. Not, oh, you're going? Oh, I see. You're going to make your toy car move fast just like the car outside. You're moving swiftly. So, therefore, you see how it's very conversational. You're adding to what children are saying. You're extending and elaborating. You're clarifying or making something more complete. Uh, sometimes children will say the word incorrectly. So they'll say, oh, I need a tephoscope. And you will not say, oh, no, 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 that's wrong. You'll just go into a conversation. Oh, I see what you mean. You want the telescope. A telescope is a little bit different than a stethoscope. I think you're confusing them. A telescope is something that you look through. A stethoscope is something that a doctor uses. Okay? So you're going to be clarifying making thing, making complete sentences, and, you know, and supporting children in stimulating their language development. All right. Now, <laughs> we also want to do self and parallel talk. So I pulled out a couple more, you know, actually a few more of my favorite um, talk show or, I guess, commentators, right, uh, talk show commentators, one of them being Rachel Ray. So one of the things we want to do is we want to um, map our own actions with self-talk. Rachel Ray does an awesome job of this, um, so does Martha Stewart as well. So as they're cooking, they're describing what they're going to do. Well, first, I'm going to take the onions, and I'm going to slice them up into three quarters of whatever. Then I'm going to mix this and I'm going to put it on top of the steak. Okay? So make sure that you are mapping your actions while you're doing it and while you're moving or else it doesn't really count because we want children to see the action and connect that to the word. So it's not really helpful to say I'm going to or I'm about to walk over here because you're not actually walking so the child can't connect the word to the action. So we're trying to use this as a technique to help children make those connections between actions and actual language. So you want to make sure you're Rachel Ray, that you are mapping what you're doing all the time. And now I'm going to go ahead and grab this book so that we're able to read our first read aloud today. Now next to me, yeah, so you're going to be mapping and talking. Basically, 
don't stop talking as much as possible. Um, of course, you will have natural pauses within conversation to facilitate children talking or to actively listen. But keep in mind, you want to keep the conversation going. Now, I also have, um, I hope this isn't too old of a reference, but we also talk about parallel talk which is mapping student actions with language. So the first person that I thought about was a sports commentator, Howard Cosell. Do you guys know Howard Cosell? I think I'm telling my age. Some of you might. So Howard Cosell, and then I got a more recent reference, uh, Bob Costas, are both sports commentators. And they describe everything play by play. So this is what you're going to do with parallel talk. In addition to mapping your actions, you're going to be describing um, the actions of other children and providing language to go with it. <gasps> and look at Mary. She, now she's stacking three of her blocks. Uh, what are you going to do next? So you're going to be describing what children are doing play by play, play in the classroom. And now Bobby is grabbing his coat. <laughs> Well, it doesn't have to sound just like that, but it should really sound more natural. Uh, well, I see Bobby's getting ready to go outside, and sometimes we use that as a little bit more as a reinforcer, so make sure you're not using it in more of like, I like the way Mary's sitting. That's a little bit more of reinforcement and a little bit of encouragement. Um, instead, we want to be describing what children are doing so other children can pay attention to it and attach language to it. So, yeah, I, I see, you know, Amy is rocking her doll and feeding her doll with a bottle. What are you going to try? Okay. Uh, yeah, I see. I see the tower that, that, that um, Bobby is building. Oh, wow. Okay. It is, it is has one, two, three. Oh, wow. What, what do you think? I see five. I see eight, is it eight blocks? What are you noticing about his tower? So you're going to be describing and then building on that language with questions and comments and descriptions. All right. Now, the last indicator that we're going to focus in on is advanced language. So advanced language looks at using, for example, a variety of words and also connecting familiar words um, I'm sorry, new words <laughs> to familiar words and ideas. So I just pulled out a interaction with balls. And these are some of the words to describe balls. Small, striped, red, cushy, glitter, tiny, water inside, shiny, bouncy, Mickey Mouse, squishy, hard, soccer, holes. So what you're going to do is, one, think about the kinds of um, vocabulary words that you want to use children, use with children that are associated with activities. Um, for example, I was in the classroom and I was um, facilitating or modeling how to use um, advanced language. And I came in and I saw the teacher was going to do a food experience. So what I did just really quickly on sticky notes is I wrote down words to go along with the foods that I saw. So she had strawberries, and she had, they were doing like um, kebabs, so it was strawberries, pineapples, um, blueberries. So I tried to pull out words, I just actually used a thesaurus. So I pulled out, of course, blue, red, squishy, um, she had a, um, what is it, the um, kebab piece, you know, so I pulled out pierce, you know, like piercing the fruit. Um, and I actually, to help me, I looked in a thesaurus. So when I looked in a thesaurus and I typed in blue, for example, I got periwinkle. Or when I typed in red, I got crimson. So I thought about um, words that children were familiar with, so knowing the children, and then thinking about what kind of novel words I can add to the conversation. So many of my teachers actually use that strategy of just looking at the forest to just get their mind going, but also listening to the children in classroom to know what is familiar to them. Okay? Oh, and I see familiar has quite a few eyes in it there. <laughs> so I've got to work on my, my spelling, don't I? So keep in mind, here, here's how the conversation goes. Uh, went. Oh, my goodness, my language. Okay, this is how the conversation went. So, oh, let's see, oh, look at you. 
Now, what do you, what kind of things are you seeing in front of you? You know, the children were able to say maybe strawberry or fruit, or some said nothing and just touch something. Oh, right, I do see you have a blueberry. Oh, yes, it's, it's, it's blue and, you know, it kind of reminds me of periwinkle a little bit, the way the color on that blueberry is a little bit lighter than the others. So, oh, I see that you're piercing that on to your skewer. That was a, another novel word. And then, wow, look at that. One, two, three. How many are, how many are you noticing? What, what are you seeing um, as you look at the strawberries? So you're bringing in novel words, and then you're making connections. Oh, yes, that is crimson. This is another word for red. <laughs> what are you noticing about your um, fruit? What do you see, you know? So I'll um, mix between, of course, yeah, all of these um, indicators build on one another. So you're noticing I'm asking questions, I'm pausing, but I'm also using a variety of words using complete sentences, and connecting something familiar with something new. Oh, that's a skewer. Huh, yeah, a skewer, well, it's kind of like a stick. But look, notice what, how this is different than a stick. Uh, this has a point on the end, as opposed to the stick that we were looking at when we were going for our walk this morning that was on the, that was on the ground. So I'm going to be explaining right, making connections, even talking about previous experiences. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed our discussion of language modeling. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. I'm an affiliate trainer for Teachstone and also a member of the Class Community Advisory Board. Teachstone, who is the creator of Class, also has tons of information about language modeling if you want to know more. Go to teachstone.com and check out their blog. I'm also on social media, so please feel free to connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Don't forget that Teachstone is also on social, social media, so please connect with us. Thanks for listening.